Friends, it's great to be with you on this second Sunday in the season of Advent. And if you were with us last Sunday, you know that uh, John did a great job of kicking off our Advent teaching series. It's called The Return of the King. And there were a few folks who came up to me after the service last Sunday. Um, They said that that title for the series made them think of a very long and much beloved book. And I'm not talking about the Bible. They were uh, talking about uh, Tolkien's uh, trilogy, uh, The Lord of the Rings. Some of you know that the third book in that series has that title, The Return of the King. And if you know the storyline to that book, then you know that there's this this city called Gondor. And it was the city that, when it had a king long ago, um, was prospering. It was a city at peace when there was a king reigning on the throne. But it's been a long time since there's been a king in Gondor. It's been a long time without a king on the throne. And as a result, the city has fallen in many ways into a state of disrepair and decay, even despair. And yet, in the midst of that despair, there's this this faint glimmer of hope uh, that one day a king will return, that a king will sit on the throne again, and when he does, everything will be right in Gondor again. And you know, that's a theme that shows up, uh, the return of the king, not just in Uh, The book with that title in The Lord of the Rings, it's a theme that shows up in other legends and stories as well. Maybe you've heard of King Arthur, the once-end future king, the return of the king. You think of the story of Robin Hood. We used to have a great king, but we don't anymore. Now there are all these problems, but maybe one day the king will come back again. It's a theme that shows up in story after story. And I think the reason why is because it's a theme that, that resonates with our hearts because it points us to the true story, to the story of God's redemption, to what God is doing to rescue and redeem his world. You know, a thousand years before Jesus was ever born, there was a great king in Israel. His name was David. In many ways, David was Israel's greatest king. In many ways, Israel was at its best when David was on the throne in Israel. But if you know the story of Israel, you know it wasn't long before the people of Israel, they started to turn away from God. Even the kings would turn away from God. And as a result, um, the people experienced a lot of of disrepair and, and decay. And the prophets came and they warned them about God's coming judgment because of their unfaithfulness. And ultimately, they were judged. They were sent off into exile in the land of Babylon. There no longer was a king on David's throne in Israel. Instead, they lived under the oppression of foreign kings. And yet, in the midst of that despair, in the midst of that destruction, the prophets did speak this glimmer of hope on that one day the king would return. One day there would be a king who would reign on the throne of David and he would establish a kingdom far greater than God's people had ever known under the kingdom of David. And if you're a Christian here today, we believe that the king has come at Christmas. The return of the king, the baby who was born in that manger in Bethlehem known as the city of David. We believe Jesus is that king who has returned. And so what we're doing in this Advent series is each week we're looking at one of the prophets, one of these prophets who spoke of the return of the king and the kingdom that would be established when this new king would come. And last week John preached from Isaiah chapter 9. Today we're going to turn our attention to the prophet Jeremiah. And if any of you have ever tried Uh, to read the book of Jeremiah, you know there's a lot of doom. There's a lot of gloom. There's a lot of talk of judgment. Actually, the first 29 chapters are all pretty dark and gloomy, but then suddenly in chapter 30, uh, there's this shift, there's this turn, because, you know, Jeremiah has been warning that the people are going to be taken into exile. Then they are taken into exile. Jerusalem is destroyed in 587 BC. Now God's people are living as exiles in the land of Babylon. And Jeremiah speaks this word of hope, uh, beginning in verse 30, 
Um, Verse 8, Eric read this a moment ago. He says, in that day, I will break the yoke off their necks and I will tear off their bonds and no longer will foreigners enslave them. So God says, one day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rescue my people from the oppression of, of these other kings. And he says, instead, they will serve the Lord their God. And did you notice this? And David, their king, whom I will raise up for them. What is that? That's the return of the king. There's going to be a king who's going to reign on David's throne forever. But did you notice his kingdom is going to be far greater than David's kingdom? Why? Because in his kingdom... Unlike what happened with David, the people are going to serve their God. They're going to love their God. They're going to delight in their God. Why? Because this new king, Jeremiah says in chapter 31, is going to establish a new covenant. The new king is going to bring a new covenant, an entirely new way of relating to God. And what I want to do this morning is I want to ask four questions about that covenant. Uh, First, what is a covenant? Some of you might be asking that question yourselves. What is a covenant? Secondly, what was wrong with the old covenant? Uh, Thirdly, what is so amazing about the new covenant? And then fourthly, fourthly, how can this new covenant change your life this Christmas? So let's walk through those four questions together. So first, what is a covenant? You might remember we sang that second song this morning. We said, God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant. You know, all throughout the Bible, the primary way in which God relates with people, the kind of relationship he wants to have with people, it's described as a covenant. And you know, a covenant, like a contract, is a legally binding kind of relationship. Some of you work in contracts every day in the work that you do. You're very familiar with contracts, and you know that just because you have a contract with somebody doesn't mean you have to like them. In fact, often, maybe you want to get a contract with somebody precisely because you do not like them, or at least you don't trust them any further than you can throw them. And so you think, I want to get this relationship down in writing in a contract so we can make sure that both sides are going to uphold what they've promised to do in the relationship. And you see, a covenant, like a contract, is legally binding. There are promises, there are vows to which people are held accountable, but is far more intimate, it's far more personal, it's far more loving a relationship than just a contract, though it is legally binding. And yet, on the other hand, a covenant, you see, a, a covenant is, it's, it's actually far more, it is far more durable, it is far more binding than just having feelings of affection for someone, than just saying, hey, I really like you. You know, I had a, I had a friend who for seven years Um, lived with his girlfriend. And throughout that time together, she would often ask him, she would say, why why don't you want to get married? I mean, we're already, you know, sharing our lives together. Why why don't you want to get married? And you know the answer he would often give to her is he would say, why do we need this, this, this sort of new legally binding kind of relationship for you to know that I love you? And some of you in this room could probably give him a pretty good answer. If you were on the other side of that, you might say, well, hang on a second. If you're unwilling to make those promises, if you're unwilling to make that commitment in a legally binding sort of way where there are consequences, should you leave the relationship? If you're unwilling to do that, what that means is you're just leaving your options open. It's actually not as loving a thing to do. And you see, the thing about a covenant is a covenant is a relationship that is far more intimate, far more personal and loving, precisely because it is binding, because it is this legal sort of commitment. And you see, this is the way in which God relates with people all throughout the Bible. And I'm sure that some of you are are thinking to yourselves, you know, that sounds a lot like a marriage, And that probably is the best example of a covenant relationship, a marriage relationship. And you might have noticed the fact that God actually describes himself in verse 32. Did you catch that? He says, I was a husband to you. 
That's one of God's favorite ways of describing his relationship with people in the Bible, a marriage relationship. And did you catch in verse 33, the classic covenant description is, I will be your God and you will be my people. Have you ever said to somebody, I want to be yours or I want you to be mine? If you have, you know that is the most intimate kind of relationship. That is the most self-giving kind of love where you're saying, I want to belong to you and I want you to belong to me. And yet that's the language that God uses to describe the kind of relationship he wants to have with us. Maybe some of you have never heard those words. Nobody has ever said to you, I want you to be mine. You've never said to them, I want you to be mine or I want to be yours. And yet, Do not miss the fact that the creator of the universe, the kind of relationship that he wants to have with you is one that really goes beyond even what what marriage can produce. Marriage is like an echo of the intimacy and the tenderness and the closeness of the kind of relationship God wants to have with each one of us. There's no other God like this. The God of the Bible, the God of covenant who would say, I want to know you at that intimate of a level, like a marriage. So that's what a covenant is. But but the second question is, well, if God says that he's going to make this new covenant, well, then that begs a question, doesn't it, of what was wrong with the old covenant, with the covenant that God says that he made when he led um, the, the people of Israel by the hand. Did you catch this? He says, when I led them by the hand out of the land of Egypt. Some of you know that story. God rescued his people out of Egypt, and then he brought them to Mount Sinai. And what did he do at Mount Sinai? He gave them his law. He gave them the Ten Commandments. And then he brought them into the promised land of Israel, and he established David to rule as the king over them. What was wrong with the way that the people related to God in the old covenant, under the old king, under King David. And you see, the problem with the old covenant was not on God's side. God was not the problem in the relationship. God was a faithful husband. He kept his promises in that covenant relationship. The problem wasn't even in the covenant relationship in and of itself. What was the problem? Jeremiah tells us, he says, the problem is that the people broke the covenant. The problem, to use the language of marriage, is that Israel was like a serial adulterer, that they were unfaithful, that they were chasing after other lovers. Jeremiah puts it this way in chapter 3. He says that, that, that the people were, were, were trying to drink from broken cisterns. What does that mean? It means that they were looking for their life where it can't be found. They were chasing their security, their happiness, their comfort, and all of these other gods. And and, and you may say, well, sure, they were sinful people just like us. But you see, God, God realized that his people would sin against him, didn't he? You know, God was not expecting sinless perfection from sinful people whom he had redeemed. That's why he gave them the sacrificial system. And how did the sacrificial system work? The idea was that when people broke his law, when they didn't follow the Ten Commandments, when they worshiped other gods, or when they didn't love their neighbors as themselves, what were they to do? They were to go and offer a sacrifice. They were to confess their sins, and the symbolism was that the death of the animal would atone for their sin. So God created this provision for their forgiveness if they came to confess their sin. But what happened with Israel, the problem... They didn't want to confess their sin. Like like us sometimes, they they didn't want to acknowledge their sin. They certainly didn't want to repent and turn from their sin. They were happy finding their life and all the other gods that they were worshiping. They didn't want to turn from those gods back to the living God. They were hard-hearted in their sin. You know, not long ago, I met with a man who wanted to meet with me Uh, Because his wife had found out he was having an affair. And he was very broken up over it. You could tell that he was very sad um, over this this new um, circumstance that he was in. And I asked him the question. Now, I've asked him this situation before. Are you more sad? Are you more upset because you got caught? 
Um, because of the uncomfortable circumstance that you're now in, the potential embarrassment or how it might affect your, your marriage relationship, are you more saddened because you got caught or, or because you know that you've broken your vows to God and to your spouse and it hurts your heart to think that you've done so? And as far as I could tell, you know, he said it was the latter. And as far as I could tell, he seemed to be genuinely repentant. In which case, there is still some hope that maybe that marriage, that covenant can be preserved. You know, maybe that, that she'll forgive him and that marriage can continue. But let me tell you, when, when, when a marriage covenant is absolutely going to break down, when it's absolutely going to fall apart, is when there is hard-heartedness. When there's an unwillingness uh, to repent, that's when marriage covenants uh, ultimately break down. That's even what Jesus says in the Gospels, doesn't he? Jesus says God created marriage to be this, this lifelong sort of relationship. What God has joined together, let no man separate. But Jesus says Moses gave you, he gave you the certificate of divorce. Why? Because of hardness of heart. And so therefore, when you have somebody who is, is hardened in, in their serial adultery, they're, they're committed to continuing that. There's no repentance. There's no change. Or when somebody continues to hurt their spouse and they continue to be neglectful of their vows to their spouse, that's when the relationship breaks down. That's when the covenant dissolves. That's when the certificate of divorce is given. And did you know that in Jeremiah chapter 3, God describes himself as a divorcee. God says in Jeremiah chapter 3, he says, I gave you, Israel, a certificate of divorce because you were constantly unfaithful to me. And, and I want you to hear that this morning because I know there are some in this room, maybe you have been through the pain of a divorce. And I know often in the church, there's a lot of stigma attached to divorce, isn't there? I mean, I want you to hear this morning that God knows what it's like to go through the pain of a divorce. He describes himself as a divorcee in Jeremiah chapter 3. Because the people of God, they have been hard-hardened in their rebellion. They have, they have broken their marital vows to God in this covenant again and again and again. And there are some of us in this room today, we know what it's like to relate to God in that way, don't we? Maybe there was a season in your life before you ever became a follower of Jesus. You can look back on that and you can think to yourself, you know, I believed that God existed, but it did not hurt my heart to think that my sin was hurting the heart of God. It did not delight or please my heart to think that I was obeying and delighting God's heart in my obedience, maybe where, where you were happy to chase after your life and pretty much everything other than in God. And maybe there was just a little bit of fear of judgment. Maybe there was a little bit of fear that God would catch up to you one day and he would punish you. But can I tell you something about fear? Fear of judgment is, is usually not a very powerful motivator for change. Not for real heart level change. Don't you see that in the people of Israel? God is constantly warning them that judgment is coming, and yet they do not repent. They do not change. And so God gives them this certificate of divorce, and he sends them off from him into exile because the covenant relationship has been broken. And that raises a really important question for us, doesn't it? Of what does that mean for the people of God? What does that mean for the future of God's plan of salvation? What does that mean for the future of the human race if his people have broken the covenant so that now God divorces them? He says this covenant is, is broken. What, what does that mean for God's future plans of salvation? And let me tell you something. When you read through the Old Testament, I don't know how many of you have tried to ever read through the Old Testament, but I'll tell you, in the Old Testament, it's not exactly clear what the answer to that question is. Because, you know, sometimes when you're reading in the Old Testament, it sounds like God's covenant is fundamentally conditional. 
that it's conditioned based on our obedience, conditioned based on our behavior and faithfulness. God says, I will be your God. You will be my people. If you keep my covenant, if you are faithful, if you keep my law, then I will bless you. I will prosper you. It will go well for you in the land. But if you break my covenant, If you are unfaithful, if you chase after and worship other gods, then I will curse you. Then I will judge you. Then I will send you away from me. There are times in the Old Testament when God's covenant seems to be fundamentally conditional. But then there are other times where it seems to be unconditional. You know, like in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3, we didn't read this, but it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. God says, I have loved you, faithless Israel. I've loved you with an everlasting love. That means I'm going to love you no matter what, regardless of how unfaithful and disobedient you have been. I will not stop loving you and pursuing you. There are places in the Old Testament where God says, I will never break my covenant to you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you no matter what you do. And so you can see that tension, can't you? Is God's covenant fundamentally conditional based on our obedience or is it unconditional? I'm going to love you no matter what you do. And and, and maybe you're you're wondering, well, what, what is the answer to that? Maybe more importantly, you're asking, why does this matter? I feel like this is a bit of a theologically heavy sort of lesson. I mean, all of this covenant language in the Old Testament, why does this matter? And, you know, when I was in seminary, I had this professor. His name was Sinclair Ferguson. And and he was probably one of the most renowned covenant theologians in the world. And I was in a class one day where he was talking about this Old Testament. Is the covenant fundamentally conditional or is it unconditional? And there was this one guy in the class, God love him, because he was one of those guys who would just say whatever was on his mind. And sometimes you need somebody like that in your class to ask what everybody else is thinking. So he raises his hand and he says, Professor Ferguson, all due respect, I know you're a great theologian. He says, but I don't want to be a theologian. I just want to be a pastor. I just want to help people with their questions, with their spiritual problems, with their issues in life. Could you please tell us why does this matter? What difference does it make, conditional or unconditional covenant? What difference is that really going to make to helping people with their problems? And you see, the great thing about Professor Ferguson, though he was this renowned theologian, he was also a pastor, been a pastor for years in Scotland and in South Carolina. And so here's the answer he gave. I'll never forget this. He said, of all the people that I've met with that have come to me with all their different sorts of questions and problems, he says, they often fall into essentially one of two categories. He said, on the the one hand, there are those who are convinced that God's covenant is fundamentally unconditional. He's going to love me no matter what I do. Yeah, he probably wants me to obey, but regardless, he's still going to love me and accept me no matter what. And you know, if, if, if you believe that, he said those who believe that, they tended to have very high self-esteem. They tended to feel very good about themselves, but he said they didn't often have a lot of conviction for sin. They often didn't feel very guilty over maybe ways in which they had hurt other people, sometimes in marriage, sometimes in other relationships. Maybe they weren't as loyal or faithful to their relationships. There was more self-indulgence. There was more selfishness. There was not as much of a a commitment to stay in relationships that would bounce from one relationship to another. He said, on the one hand, there were those who fell into that category. He said, on the other hand, there were those who thought that God's covenant was ultimately conditional, that his love for them was, was based on their obedience. And so if they felt like they had really screwed up, they'd really messed up, then there was no way that they were going to believe that they were loved and forgiven. They would beat themselves up. They felt very badly about themselves. Or if they thought that they were living up to God's standards at that particular moment of time, they tended to be very judgmental, very self-righteous, very legalistic, and prone to look down on the failures of others. He said, typically, people would fall into one of those two categories. It's unconditional or it's conditional. And you can see all the problems that would bring with it. And you may ask, well, then what's the answer? What's the solution if you're not going to sort of fall into one of those strands? And by the way, if you fall into either of those strands, you're going to have an anemic view of who God is. 
Because you're kind of picking and choosing one part of the Bible over another part. And so what's the answer? What's the solution? I'll tell you, that's the hope that Jeremiah gives us in this passage, is that God is going to make a new covenant through the new king. That's the hope, that God is going to establish this new covenant. And can I tell you, this new covenant, it's not an unconditional covenant, nor is it a conditional covenant. Let me explain the new covenant to you this way. The new covenant is that God's love for us is so unconditional that he was willing to come and to fulfill all the conditions of the covenant for us. It's not as if you turn the page from the Old Testament to the New Testament and God stops being holy. He stops being just. He stops caring about keeping our promises and being faithful to his law and keeping his law. It's not as if God ceases to be a holy and just God when you enter the New Testament. No, rather, the new covenant hope, the wonder of Christmas, the message of Christmas, is this new covenant that God is so unconditional in his love for us that he was willing to come fulfill all the conditions of the covenant for us. Friends, that's why Jesus was born. Every moment of Jesus' life, every breath that he breathed, all throughout his life, what was he doing? He was fulfilling our side of the covenant. He was living a life of perfect obedience to God, of worshiping God, of loving his neighbor as himself. In his life, he was fulfilling our side of the covenant. You remember the side that says, if you are faithful, I will bless you. Jesus was living that out for us in his life. And then in his death, the other side of the covenant. If you are unfaithful, if you turn from me, if you reject me, I will curse you. And that's what Jesus was experiencing for us on the cross. Galatians chapter 3 says that on the cross, Jesus was cursed for us. Galatians 3 says, cursed is anyone who is hung upon a tree. That curse, that judgment, what we deserve for God, our husband, to cast us off forever away from him. That's what Jesus endured so that we could be brought in. And you see, what we have then in this new covenant is is neither unconditional or conditional then. It's, It's a fully kept covenant. We are not covenant keepers now. We are recipients of a fully kept covenant covenant. And that's what Jeremiah is speaking of when he says that in verse 34, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Do you know what that means? Unlike in the Old Testament where people would have to come sacrifice, they would have to confess. And if they did so, then they might be forgiven. That's not the way we relate to God anymore. It's not like you go to church every Sunday. If you do the prayer of confession, then God will forgive you. No, God is going to do something so radical. He's going to remove our sin from us once and for all. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross so that now we are recipients of a fully kept covenant. And you see, it's only love that extravagant, love that amazing, that undeserved to think that God would not only uphold his side of the covenant, but that he would come and he would fulfill our side of the covenant as well. It's only love that extravagant that can begin to change the fundamental structure of a human heart so that we obey not out of fear of judgment, but we obey willingly, out of gratitude, out of love. That's what Jeremiah is talking about when he says God is going to write his law on our hearts. That when we see what he has done to remove our sin from us, now we're going to want to obey. That's what we're going to sing about in just a moment in that song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross on Which the Prince of Glory Died. Love so amazing, so divine, what does it do? It demands my soul, my heart, my all. It makes me want to obey willingly when I see what Jesus has done for me. And let me tell you, if you believe this is your new relationship with God in the new covenant, let me tell you how it's going to change your Christmas. And I'll just end briefly here. You remember those two groups of people that Dr. Ferguson talked about? Those who are are totally convinced, God's going to love me no matter what I do, the unconditional approach. Some of us maybe in the Christmas season are prone to go to that place where we can be kind of consumeristic. 
We can think, what's in this for me? What gifts am I going to give? Or we begrudge the gifts that we have to give to others or the time we have to give or all the planning and preparation for the sake of, of, of helping others to celebrate their Christmas. Does anybody relate with that in this room? I know I can go to that place. And when we find ourselves in that self-indulgent, consumeristic place, what do we need? We need to remember not that there were no conditions to God's covenant. No, we need to see rather that he fulfilled those conditions for us. Sin is serious. It's so serious that Jesus had to die for it. God cares about us obeying his law so much that he came to fulfill it for us. And a God so faithful to us that he would uphold his side of the covenant and ours as well, doesn't that make you want to be a more faithful person? To be a more self-giving person? To be somebody who follows through in your relationships to say, how can I do things that are going to bless and serve others, not just what's in this for me? Some of us are in maybe that place. Others of us, though, we're like the people who can't get over the fact that God's love wouldn't be conditional. And maybe you're in a place where it's hard for you to really believe that the wonder of God's love at Christmas is really for you. To think he could really accept you based on undeserved grace. And what do you need? You need to see that Jesus did fulfill all those conditions for you. He was cursed for you so that you might know nothing but God's blessing. Can you believe that? Can you, can you trust in that? Can you rest in that this Advent season? And you know, speaking of rest, one last thing. And on our community group this last week, if there was one theme that came up from everybody in the group, it's that this feels like a busy time of year. There's a lot to do. There's gifts to buy, there's presents to wrap, there's things to plan, there's decorating, maybe there's work that you're doing in your job that you're trying to get all finished and wrapped up before the end of the year and you feel busy this season. What I want you to hear this morning is that the message of Christmas is not do a better job or try harder to keep up your end of the covenant. The wonder and message of Christmas is that we are recipients of a fully kept covenant. It's a gift. And all we have to do is receive it and rest in the wonder of that grace for us. And so let's pray as we come to the Lord's table this morning.